Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The annual Shangri-La Dialogue has just wrapped up in Singapore, where defense ministers gathered to discuss security concerns in Asia and around the world. To shed some light on key global issues and challenges facing the world today, I talked to two participants of the summit, Sui Tian Kai, former Chinese vice foreign minister in the first half, and Chen Dongxiao, president of the Shanghai Institutes for International Studies in the second half. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, well, the U.S. Defense Secretary uh, talked about uh, the U.S. success, basically, in building its leadership in the Asia-Pacific region by reinforcing alliance or by building new alliances. Uh, but others expressed the concern that, you know, such a behavior uh, could lead to, say, the division or dividing destabilizing or even militarizing the entire region. I wonder, uh, what's your opinion on that? The speech by the U.S. Secretary of Defense has got a lot of attention. But honestly, he has not offered some fresh ideas, not many constructive proposals. For instance, they talk about U.S. leadership in the region. But my question is, where are they trying to lead us? Towards greater stability or deeper division? More cooperation or more confrontation? It's not so clear. And we have to listen to what they say, but more importantly, we have to watch what they are doing. So the challenge and the challenge too and violation of one China policy, for instance, and the uh, mounting reconnaissance activities so close to China, a setting up of uh, confrontational camps, military alliances, and also introducing of highly enriched nuclear material into the region. All these things. Are they helping us to, greater, uh, to achieve greater stability or are they introducing more elements of instability into the region? Mm -hmm. A related question I think is uh, also raised actually after the speech uh, uh, by a delegate um, is about uh, you know, when he talked about the U.S. leadership uh, by building these alliances, uh, you know, usually it's done by bypassing the ASEAN uh, or ignoring the ASEAN centrality, which uh, says that you know, ASEAN is the dominant regional platform to overcome common challenges or involve with uh, external big powers. Uh, so you see, you know, this, they talked about you know, respecting ASEAN centrality, but at the same time, if you look at what they have done, they are ignoring the ASEAN centrality. Uh, so there's a contradiction. It was raised in the uh, meeting, but uh, in Lord Austin, uh, intentionally or you know, or unintentionally, he avoided answering this question. How do you see this relationship? You know, ASEAN centrality, and then the U.S. is doing things basically by building new mechanisms, new initiatives, you know, outside or beyond ASEAN. ASEAN centrality is one of the most important principles in regional cooperation in Asia Pacific. And ASEAN countries attach great importance to that. We in China also attach great importance to that. Frankly, I think the United States very often just pay lip service to this principle. They, they also talk about well, they like this idea. Indeed. But watch what they are doing. There's no ASEAN in Quad. There is, no, there is no ASEAN in AUKUS. So where is the central role of ASEAN? We can only see the absence of ASEAN. The Chinese uh, defense minister you know, has a speech uh, on the uh, China's security initiatives. Uh, uh, we know last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, put forward the Global Security Initiative. Uh, uh, you know, it stresses the inclusiveness. But if you look at the U.S., it's really about, uh, you know, camps against another country. Um, is that uh, the difference, the, the major difference 
uh, you see in the two visions of uh, security in the region and around the world? President Xi Jinping has put forward three global initiatives. The Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. All these initiatives are in the framework of our proposal to build a community of nations for a shared future. And for the security initiative, I think that the key idea, the central idea, is to adopt a new security approach based on common security, comprehensive security, cooperative security, and sustainable security. So the security approach China would advocate will very much be based on common interests of the regional countries and would be aim at a more secure and better common future. It's very inclusive. Its stress is on cooperation and it will have the equal participation of all the regional countries. But what the U.S. is doing, they're setting up exclusive confrontational small groups and they are advocating the so-called democracy versus autocracy and so on. So they are trying to divide the world, divide the region into different categories of countries. I don't think that, that will help anybody's security, including United States' own security. More division will only lead to more conflicts, more confrontation. So the end outcome is everybody's interest will be hurt. That's an interesting point, you know, where U.S. often, by their policy or behavior, they created this kind of a crisis, a conflict, or confrontation, and then they would basically blame the Chinese side for not picking up the phone to talk to them. On the Taiwan question, the U.S. Defense Secretary said that the you know, U.S. remains committed to preserving the status quo and uh, basically oppose unilateral moves uh, to change the status quo. Uh, but at the same time, we do see, for example, uh, the former U.S. House uh, Speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi, you know, their provocative visit to Taiwan, and the U.S. continues to sell arms to Taiwan, and the recently they strike a trade deal uh, with Taiwan, which of course uh, sort of violating the One China principle. Uh, so uh, how do you make of this? You know, what do you make of the U.S. policy, the rhetoric, and then the action on the ground? Well, first of all, the Taiwan question is entirely domestic affairs of China. But because of U.S. intervention, the problem is still with us. So if the U.S. is truly committed to this one China principle, or what they call one China policy, they should stop interference in China's domestic affairs. They should stop arms sale to Taiwan, stop official ties with Taiwan, and really implement the three judge communique. I think that that's the, the essence of the Taiwan question. Lord Austin did say that you know, conflict uh, is not uh, uh, in imminent, uh, nor is it uh, unavoidable. And he seems to be stack, you know, stepping back or walking back a little bit from previous you know, talk by U.S. generals of uh, a war, a military conflict across the Taiwan Straits, like in 2022, 2025, uh, or 2027, etc. Uh, so do you see there is a say, reduced reduction uh, you know, or stepping back in terms of policy from the U.S. side? Again, we should not only listen to what they say, we should watch what they are doing. Okay, so action speaks louder. Yeah, of course, words. of course. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you for your time and insight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chen. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, I, I want to, your opinion or your understanding of this Shangri-La Dialogue, the 20th edition uh, in 2023. So what's, what's the major theme of this year's dialogue? Well, see, I've been to Shangri-La Dialogue uh, quite many times. And uh, I still remember I attended Shangri-La Dialogues on their uh, 10th anniversary, that about 10 years ago. And 
this is the 20th anniversary. I think that uh, the organizers, WIWS, a think tank, as well as a Singapore, Singaporean government, they want to stress a more balanced term or message uh, in their um, structuring the themes, the sessions of uh, dialogue. And so if you look at those uh, seven plenary sessions, as well as many of the special sessions. They have uh, you know, folks on the United States, China, uh, Asia Pacific Partnership, Security Cooperation, ASEAN Centrality, uh, as well as a Ukraine war and its implications on Asia Pacific. So I think at least in terms of those players, they try to be more uh, inclusive of those small players, mm -hmm. as well as many other uh, specific issues with more dimensions, cyber, nuclear, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, inclusive and also they try, try yes. to be objective, uh, yes. neutral, let's yeah. say. Uh, well, not necessarily neutral, but I think at least... Uh, to be more balanced? The, they try to bring more perspectives. More perspectives, uh, th that's the way to put it. Um, well, 10 years ago, um, you were here you know, joining this uh, dialogue now, uh, 10 years later. Uh, do you think this global security situation is worsening? You know, we have a Ukraine war, as you mentioned, um, and now, uh, you know, China-US tensions are rising in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so, you know, people see there's more uncertainty than certainty. <laughs> how, how do you see that? Well, um, I agree that uh, we have seen a deteriorating uh, security situation, both globally and regionally. I think that generally speaking, uh, compared with, for instance, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific is still relatively stable, but we obviously have seen more uh, tensions, uh, including, as you said, that uh, the U.S.-China more constrained relationship, as well as, as many other uh, regional uh, tensions in this area. Um, so obviously we have seen a worsening uh, situation and also a more uh, difficult difficulties in security governance. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when it comes to the Shangri-La uh, dialogue, you know, often, uh, you know, probably the focus is, has always been like China-U.S. relationship in the uh, like arena of security uh, affairs. And uh, for this year, of course, the Chinese Defense Minister Li Zhangfu uh, talks about the China's new security initiative. Uh, we know that last year, the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, put forward this uh, global security initiative. Uh, for a lot of people, probably they are not familiar with this, you know, uh, what's the gist of this initiative? I think that the key messages of this security initiative will focus on that the security is more with others rather than against others. That will, that means uh, the new security initiative, which has been initiated by President Xi uh, quite many years ago, as well as I think nowadays has been echoed uh, many, many times by Chinese uh, officials, including the General uh, Li's uh, key keynote speech. I think that uh, his speech continues to focus on the comprehensiveness of the security uh, we have faced today, and also the more cooperative nature in the security. So I think that the key message is the security should be with others for the common security rather than the security against each other. So the security of the country A should be taken into consideration. I mean, so is the, the security issue of country B. Yes, this is a, I think, um, the, the nature of the world we are living in because we are living in a hyper-connected interdependent world. 
uh, whatever the size of the country, of the economies, whatever the political or whatever the differences of the political institutions and ideologies of uh, each country, that we have to live with together for those common goods of our security as well as against those common challenge. So I think that uh, this is a hyper-connected, interdependent world in which we have to stress the importance of a comprehensive dimensions of security, which means that not only refers to those traditional sovereignty, territorial security or safety, but also we need to deal with how the climate change, for instance, how those a public uh, health uh, situation, and how those even financial instability and its implications for the security of each other. So I think they are related to each other, and we have to face with them. No country would say that this one, this country is immune from over others, uh, from those uh, threats or challenges. So this means that we have to be inclusive. We have to have to be work together against those a uh, common bats. With that in mind, you know, how do you describe or how do you characterize the Chinese vision of the regional security in the Asia Pacific region? I think nowadays the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges we face in Asia Pacific is we have seen the rising of those ideology-based uh, military alliance or bloc, which exclusive to some other countries, particularly excluding China. Such kind of a ideology-based uh, military-focused alliance, they have polarized rather than help or facilitate the unification or integration of this region. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we need to work together to be against, but it's quite, quite tough. Mm. Are you talking about uh, you know, orcs between, I would say, among the Australia, US, UK, and also the Quad and uh, initiatives like this? Yes, I think that we have seen, I, I myself quite concerned about those uh, trend, particularly uh, the occurs. I think that uh, it is uh, this a newly emerged one uh, military security alliance um, focusing on China, a so-called China threat. I think that it will only uh, make this region uh, much more polarized and also, you know, uh, not prevent the, the perforation, but uh, actually had uh, uh, lead, lead up to a more proliferation of nuclear or nuclear related uh, uh, issue. I think that that's quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if uh, we look at the Ukraine issue, uh, you know, and the, let's say the uh, Chinese security or new security initiative view, um, what, what went wrong and then we have this, uh, you know, crisis here in European continent? I think fundamentally speaking, um, the Ukraine war or Ukraine crisis is the result of a failure of security governance uh, on the continent of Europe. Uh, specifically speaking, the NATO's relationship with Russia. I think that the security dilemma, while it is always, it's always a kind of a uh, phenomena with different degrees uh, in different parts of the world, but the security dilemmas uh, between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side is extremely uh, deteriorated in the past few decades. And I think that NATO's expansion itself uh, have not addressed uh, the legitimate concerns, security concerns of Moscow, even if NATO always rejected those cl claims. But at the same time, I think that uh, so um, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, a deep-rooted uh, strategic suspicion between two sides. And the failure in governing of the security dilemma and make uh, Moscow take a quite extreme or radical uh, manner. So speak of NATO, you know, uh, I think I understand that, that you know, some European 
politicians or experts would say, uh, you know, they are defensive. Uh, it's a defensive organization. Sometimes uh, they, um, it sounds like uh, it's an innocent, you know, charity organization, but the others would see it's a military organization. It's threatening by nature. And then they are setting a liaison office in Tokyo. And China is concerned with uh, that kind of expansion of NATO somehow, you know, into Asia Pacific. Are you concerned with that? Oh, yes. I think that the NATO is a uh, military organization uh, set up in the Cold War era uh, for the competition uh, with the Warsaw Pact in the Cold War era. And the Cold War has been gone for more than 30 more years already, but the NATO is still there. And it is expanding, and also there's a trend of a globalization of NATO or Asia Pacificization of NATO. I think that uh, this actually has caused more security challenge for those countries in Asia Pacific, including China. And I also believe that uh, some of other countries in Asia Pacific, like ASEAN countries, they are also quite concerned about the expansion of the NATO or, a, or the Asia Pacific version of the NATO. It related to, say, uh, the speech um, by the U.S. Defense Secretary, uh, Lord Austin, which is um, uh, basically surrounding the theme of um, U.S. leadership in the Indo-Pacific. The Chinese side uh, has put forward uh, its version or its vision of a security in terms of a security initiative uh, globally and probably for China too. And here the U.S. is talking about its leadership. Uh, so how do you see this two different versions of or two, two different vision of security for the Asia Pacific region? Well, I think that the key differences is between one is the perception of the threats. Uh, I think from Beijing's perspective, the key challenge or the threat to the regional security is those uh, ideology based and the military uh, focused alliance, which will make this region even more fragmented and polarized instead of a more integration and unification. So I think this is always, Beijing said that uh, we need to focus on the inclusiveness and the cooperative security. While I think that Washington's perspective is they, the strategic culture or their strategic security culture is focused on the so-called enemy hunting. And they are more concerned about the so-called pacing peer, here refers to China. And they believe the rising China is definitely the threat of this security. Actually, it's the threat. I, I think that they believe it is the challenge to the, uh, the leadership or the primacy of the United States in this region. But of course, I think that this is uh, very misleading. But anyway, I think that uh, as long as the Washington continue to build up uh, those security alliance, uh, it has caused uh, more concerns than instability. Yeah, more instability, uh, or let's say, you know, in terms of a peace and uh, prosperity, probably not that sustainable um, if you insist on your leadership. I think, so, yeah, I think so. In the long term, it must be unsustainable if China is always excluded in those uh, uh, multilateral uh, security arrangements. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, China-U.S. security uh, relationship is critical uh, in terms of peace and stability in this region. Uh, right before the dialogue, the Shangri-La dialogue, you know, there's an episode of uh, basically the Chinese side rejected the U.S. overture uh, mm -hmm. to have meetings between the two defense uh, uh, of uh, ministers. Um, and of course, you know, the, the reality is like uh, the U.S has failed to lift or to remove the, you know, the coercive measures on, against the Chinese side, against the Chinese defense minister. So if the U.S. truly wants to have a dialogue, I mean, how difficult it is to remove those measures? Well, that's a very good question. I think that uh, we have seen a quite a, a contradictory um, or conflicting message coming from Washington. Uh, on one side, I think that uh, to pursue or to have a serious 
lines of communication, including uh, the DOD on their side and the PLA on China's side is very important because to have those DOD and the PLA people always have a dialogue, particularly at the senior level, is very important for the confidence building and even for crisis management. But on the other side, as you said, as you said, uh, uh, Beijing is not in the interest of the talk just for the sake of talk. The purpose of a talk is to build up the confidence as well as to reduce the miscalculation. And I think that in order to show the sincerity, Washington should do something to show that such kind of dialogue is not only for the sake of dialogue, it's not only kind of a show, but also to really to reduce the tension, to reduce the miscalculation. And I think that uh, some of those sanctions are very important signals that Washington should do, removing those sanctions by their previous administrations. So I think that uh, this is the reason uh, why uh, Beijing rejected that. I think that uh, uh, Washington's statements that they are quite concerned about the so-called Beijing's are interested in uh, engaging with or have a dialogue with the United States is very uh, misleading. Yeah, it's, it's, they are blaming the Chinese side uh, for, in their words, you know, lack of uh, willingness to engage. Uh, it's unfair. It's it, it, obviously unfair. I think that Beijing is interested in. Beijing's always say that uh, we are going to have a talk with you. But the talk for what? So basically the Beijing's top concern is like, uh, you know, whether there is a sincerity from Washington to have and dialogue. whether it is reliable, has credibility because of those, a, what I call the political decay in the Washington. Um, whether president's words or their senior officials' words could be kept in the next administration, whether those uh, remarks by an executive branch will uh, be, you know, uh, a quite short, uh, will maintain a short period of time because of strong opposition from the Congress. So I think Beijing, it is very legitimate for Chinese people to say that if you are going to interest in a real serious dialogue, show your sincerity as well as political will. But uh, so far, I don't think that uh, those political will is strong enough. So or if sometimes we have seen a, a lot of conflicting messages. Is especially, you know, given this uh, uh, U.S. domestic situation, you know, the only consensus, you know, <laughs> in, inside of the country is uh, probably hostility toward China. Yes. So yes. there's a legitimate question, you know, whether if there's any agreement, whether that would be carried, carried about. Carried yeah, a lot of promises or commitments uh, has not been fulfilled because of a toxic atmosphere in Washington. So I think that that has made uh, Chinese people, uh, Beijing, even more suspicious about whether uh, those kind of talk will produce a substantial results. That yeah, will be meaningful. Meaningful. Thank you, Mr. Jen. Nice talk. <laughs>